Now, Roy Wood Jr., I love this guy. Uh, Roy is a daily show correspondent, podcaster, actor, one of the most beloved and successful stand-up comedians working these days. But none of that, I did not know that, that none of it would have been possible hadn't he been arrested and he faced prison at 19 years old. So Roy used that tough time in his life to turn his life around, and now, of course, he's a man on top, starring as a detective opposite John Hamm in the new movie, Confess Fletch. Take a look. What, no daycare today? My wife had a doctor's appointment. My nanny is um, indisposed. It's your support dog's birthday. Is that dog registered anywhere? I'd love to send it something. OK, look, are you here to confess? No, but I did have some ideas about the case. <laughs> we are not working on this case together, Erwin. <laughs> Hear me out. What is happening? Uh, what? Hands can parade around naked all day, but God forbid you show a few toes. Oh, God. Please welcome Roy Wood Jr. to the show! I wore feathers and you just came out jazzy. Look at you. You look so handsome. Well, I'm trying to redeem myself. We back outside. Well, that's funny. You wearing that Zoom wardrobe? You can't wear your Zoom wardrobe. It's funny because I just saw a tweet speaking of wardrobe. Look at what Roy posted about his childhood. Look at this. He said, I love it. He said, how much time needs to pass before you can safely confront your parents about some bleep they made you wear? You're 13 in the photo. I'm 43 now. 30 Is 30 old. years enough time? <laughs> even back then, double-breasted now, but even back then, in 1990s, just double-breasted. Hey, somebody on your Twitter feed said you look like Phil Jackson. Back in, remember, you used to wear those NBA suits? Bulls <laughs> the coach. Bulls coach. Somebody said I look like a supervisor at Vacation Bible School. <laughs> I love it. Well, I was thinking, too, I was like, it's so funny. We're talking about this wardrobe, and it's the desire to buy fancy things that got you in trouble when oh, you yeah. were 19. Oh, yeah. You now, were I, Tell us what happened, because I know I the story, but I want to hear from you. I didn't know this at the time, but apparently when you go to a department store and you s select items, you have to pay for them. <laughs> but, yeah, we got caught up, you know... Credit card fraud. Clothes. Yeah, we were taking credit cards, buying clothes, selling clothes on campus. Like, I was the dude you came to if you need to look fresh on campus. And so... In that time, when you get arrested, like, and th this is an important detail. At the time, the number one show on TV was Oz. Like, the HBO's number one show was right, Oz. Right. And Oz was not like Orange is the New Black, <laughs> if we're talking about jail shows. So my, my, the idea of what I thought prison to be, I thought that would be me, and so I fell into a depression. So between the time of sentencing, between the time of getting arrested and sentencing, yeah. I started doing stand-up comedy. Well, but I want to pause you a second, because, so, there's this kid who makes a bad decision, but at the same time, I know that you wanted to be a journalist or a sportscaster. I think we even have a clip um, to play. Yeah, I was play. going to school for Let's journalism. Let's play that. Yeah, I wanted to be Stuart Scott. Now, because there's no ball, no scoreboard, or even an opponent, many might say that cheerleading isn't a sport, or that you don't have to be an athlete to do it. But try telling that to Florida A&M's cheerleading squad, and those women will surely beg to do it. Don't clap for that. I mean, don't. How does the kid in the church suit clutching the mic by day, <laughs> sneaking into dealers with bad credit cards? I mean, what, what well, happened there? You weren't raised this way. So well, what happened? I think what I realized, my father passed when I was 16, yeah. and it took going to therapy to discover this. But I think what a lot of it boiled down to is the choices I made as a teenager in my early 20s was because I simply did not want to be a burden to my mother. Aww. It wasn't about. I love crime. It was just, you just get tired of asking your mom because she's sacrificed so much and she's done so much. And you, as a as an only child, my mother's only child, you know, you don't want to burden her because you already know how hard she's worked for you. So let me go and deal it and get these jeans so I can look fresh for home. Come, oh, da hey, mama, can you come get me out of jail? Oh, my God. So, you know, that's, that's what happened. And so the depression that comes with feeling like you're throwing your life away is what hit me. And so comedy was the only thing because after you get arrested, you lose your friends. You lose, I was suspended Yeah, everybody, the kids I, who were like, doing it with you stopped talking to you. You lose everybody. And yeah. so all I had was comedy and 20 hours a week at Golden Corral. That was my life. That was your life. At a part-time job, and I worked the road. And my mom, even in that time, you know, and I've always said that she was my number one fan because she supported me even when 
she didn't know what the hell I was doing because I was sleeping in bus stations doing stand-up because I didn't have a car. What? And I slept in a bus, I came to Birmingham to do an open mic and one of my mom's students from her college saw me sleeping in the bus station, went and snitched to her and she got me a car. Oh. Even when I didn't completely know where this dream would head, my mother blindly supported it and I'm forever thankful to her for that because without that car, I wouldn't be sitting here with you. Wow. Coming yeah. up. Wait until you mom. hear about That's the amazing revelation Roy learned about his family. More with Roy Wood Jr. after the break. <laughs> Welcome back. We are talking about how bad times can bring out the best in people, and today's guests all are sharing. Sometimes those low moments can lead us to catapult to our dreams. And I told you the last time you were, you are one of my favorite comedians. I mean, second to Eddie Murphy. That's fair. <laughs> That's fair. You'll take that. You'll take that. You had a couple of breaks. You took your mom, you know, still being there, getting you that car. But I know that after you faced um, jail at 19, it was got a probation. probation. Well, yeah, pro yeah, you were faced. You could have gone to jail. You didn't, thank God. I'm you got probation. To. You were supposed to. Yeah. The probation officer gave you clearance to go on tour. He didn't give me clearance per se, but. <laughs> He simply said, if you can prove that you went where you went, I will not ask questions where you have gone. <laughs> so you but took like, that as a yes. Yeah, but let me give you an example. And this is where we talk about recidivism and how there's more people on probation than in prison. Okay. And so those people going back into prison, it boils down to the decisions of the judge, a lazy lawyer, or a probation officer mm -hmm. who could either pour into you yeah. or be your worst nightmare. And I was just, I got lucky. I got one that poured into me. So if you go somewhere, when you're on probation and you travel, mm -hmm. you have to prove, as a comedian, you yeah. have to prove that you did a show. I'm an open micer. My name ain't on the flyer, but he goes, your name has to be on the flyer to prove, because I have to prove to my supervisors that what you're saying is yeah. going to happen. Prove the event is going to happen. So it seems to me someone should make a flyer. Wink, wink. And that's how I learned graphic design. You are a hustler, man. But, you know, you... You just have to figure out ways to grow. Yeah. And everybody is somebody because of somebody else. I can't remember which member of Goody Mob said that, but that's always stuck with me. And I've always been thankful for people like that because I get out of college and then I end up at the radio station in my hometown yeah. and then I'm doing mornings. And essentially, if the gig was less than four hours from Birmingham, mm -hmm. I drove back every day so that I could keep my job at the radio station. <sighs> so I would sleep four hours. In, like, let's just say I'm going, I'll drive up to Louisville, do yeah. the show, sleep till two in the morning, drive four hours back to Birmingham, do the morning show till 10, sleep till two at my mama's house, get back in the car, be back in Louisville by 7 p.m. to do another comedy show, sleep at like just back and forth, back, back, and, forth, and, forth. back now, and forth. I would, I missed a couple showers, I'm gonna be honest. <laughs> You live this life, Tamara. You're gonna miss I, a couple I know, showers. I that's the key. That's another key to success. You got to tell your people. You got to miss a shower. Not, as a reporter, I have changed clothes in the back of <laughs> every kind of taxi because when I was reporting in the field, we'd have to change and do it. I've some horror stories with some taxi best, drivers and cameramen because I had to hustle. I had to keep it going. The best advice I ever got from any Daily Show correspondent when oh. I first started with Trevor Noah came from Jessica Williams. Oh, and, I love Jessica. She was just on our show. And. Wonderful Jessica Williams told me the week that I started, she said, you need to be ready to iron your clothes on a diaper changer in a bathroom yes, in yes. Iowa. Yes, yes. And I'm like, what you talking about? You crazy. And then two there weeks you later, I'm ironing a suit 